Austin. Hello, Jonathan, one of our board members. It's already time. Oh, hello, Maggie and Leon. Thank you so much. It's uh, time to get going. I'm going to start with a uh, shout out and a thank you to all our supporters worldwide. Uh, I'm coming to you from Houston, uh, a lone uh, Rothschild, our esteemed guest, coming to us, I assume, from his home in Israel, uh, 8 p.m. in the evening. Avi Sadiv is in Toronto, our executive director of the Canadian branch of SPNI, CSPNI, an independent uh, tax exempt uh, non profit organization, as is ASPNI, also called Nature Israel, uh, based in New York. Our executive director, Robin Gordon, uh, and uh, our board members, and uh, all over the United States and Canada, uh, New Jersey based and uh, Toronto based, but also out to Austin and New Mexico and uh, LA now. So uh, we're truly a national organization in the United States and in Canada as well. Board member out in uh, Victoria. Uh, shout out to Jonathan Schechter. Uh, Arizona I'm looking at now, lots of stuff going on. Hello, Aram in Rockland County. The Orangetown Jewish Center is uh, represented here. Thank you guys all very much for coming, for uh, being here. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to those in Israel. Uh, my name is Jay Shofit. I'm Director of Partnerships and Development here for SPNI. Uh, here, I say here, I'm in Houston at the moment visiting family, but uh, live in Tel Aviv. SPNI, as you know, is a national organization in Israel uh, based all over the country. Um, but uh, Alon and I both work out of our headquarters in Tel Aviv. Um, I uh, want to make sure that you're all aware that uh, in addition to this webinar, which we'll get to introducing in a second. Uh, we have a very unique and special event on Tu uh, Thursday morning, Thursday morning America time on uh, this coming Thursday, January 28th, Tu uh, We are coming to you live from the JBO, the Jerusalem Bird Observatory, the Neely and David Jerusalem Bird Observatory, very, very special urban nature spot in Jerusalem uh, with people from the field in Eilat and in Hula uh, and other places in Israel. Uh, really hope you join. We're doing it at 8 a.m. New York time. Sorry for all of you people out west and uh, further west than New York, but we had to catch the daylight in Israel for the special live birding to Bishvat adventure. Um, we'll see a lot of birds. We'll see some ringing and we'll see people in the field uh, from all over. It will be very special. Uh, I think there's a uh, link to register already in the registration you got for this event. And we'll be sending more this coming week. And uh, with no further ado, we will uh, also mention this coming uh, event on uh, Thursday, Tu B'Shvat is also part of the Big Climate Fest. That's a major North American Jewish climate virtual festival sponsored by a couple of major national organizations, Dayenu, which is a new player in the climate change game, a uh, Jewish climate change organization uh, founded by Jenny Rosen um, and uh, has a lot of uh, support and is gaining a lot of ground in putting climate change on the uh, Jewish communal agenda as well as Chazon, a uh, player in the field for a long time. And we are now part of that as well with this special Tu B'Shvat event. Uh, thank you, Lawrence, for uh, pushing that forward. Uh, Lawrence Kazmir, usually doing back, back office, uh, chair duties with Avi here. Anyway, uh, we will get to our current event, which is uh, Alon Rothschild, the Director of Biodiversity Policy uh, in SPNI, the Society of Protection of Nation Israel, will be speaking to us about Israeli afforestation policy. This is truly one of my favorite topics. Alone is an author of a report from a couple of years ago, uh, translated online. I will put the uh, link in the chat. Uh, I highly recommend uh, you read it. He's going to be reviewing it and its major points today. Uh, Alone is a uh, veteran in the field and a very respected voice in the environmental movement in Israel in biodiversity policy. His project Tevabiz um, helps um, businesses uh, work more sustainably, changing their, uh, the way that they work in order to be more sustainable, especially in order to protect nature, uh, the incredible, unique, and uh, diverse species of it in Israel and the habitats in which they live, uh, which is a, it's a very important growing concern, I would say, in the environmental movement in Israel as well. Teva Biz beginning to change the face of, um, of the business sector. Uh, but right now, we're going to be talking about a forestation policy for Tu B'Shvat. It's uh, traditional, uh, as you all know, to plant a tree in Israel. Uh, this apparently was a tradition that became, uh, came up um, uh, in the early times of uh, the early years of Zionism. Uh, uh, 
Uh, one rabbi decided to plant some trees in his yeshiva in Zichor and Yaakov in 1908. Uh, the Jewish National Fund, which uh, was purchasing land for the nascent yeshuv, picked up on that idea. And ever since then, uh, well-meaning Jews have been planting trees in Israel on Tubishvat, or at least paying for their planting, supporting them uh, as they'll do this year. Um, but uh, we ask a different question. Uh, Alone, uh, if you'd like to come on, we'd introduce you. Alone is going to be uh, presenting and sharing his screen uh, on Israel's afforestation policy, uh, what is really going on with it, and um, <clears throat> we will. I'll follow up afterwards. There'll be questions. I'm sure you'll have many uh, because you're probably going to be surprised. So, uh, Alone, thank you very much. Really, really looking forward to this. One of my favorite topics of SBNI. Okay, I hope you can see it and uh, I hope that uh, you can hear me. So, uh, hi everybody. Uh, like Jay said, uh, my name is Alon, and uh, that's actually oak tree in uh, Hebrew. And uh, I uh, love trees, but uh, what I'm going to present you today is the fact that trees, unfortunately, are not necessarily uh, the ultimate solution to all problems. And that uh, if it's in the wrong place, and done in the wrong way, it might be harmful, not only to nature, but also to climate change and mitigation. Uh, so uh, we we'll are start by trying to uh, focus on what we do have in Israel. And you can see here in this short uh, film, uh, the golden eagle in the grasslands of, uh, of uh, Israel. Uh, Israel is in the semi-arid area. Uh, we are not in uh, Northern America or Northern Europe. Uh, we are on the edge of the desert and actually the uh, most beautiful uh, landscapes and species that we have are actually desert or uh, uh, more dry uh, uh, areas which are uh, scarce in trees. Uh, these are open grasslands or, uh, or uh, shrublands and we have lots of uh, interesting species and beautiful landscape over there. Uh, we call it bata, uh, that's a, a shrubland uh, or grassland in uh, Hebrew. Um, so these are a few of the inhabitants of, uh, of the grasslands uh, in Israel. Um, and this is, uh, if you will, uh, the negative uh, side of the picture. These are afforestation uh, actions done by the JNF, by Kakal in the Northern Negev. You can see here bulldozers. You can see here uh, um, um, earthworks that actually change the entire structure of the, of the uh, terrain. Uh, it looks a bit like uh, a preparation of Israel towards the Iranian invasion, but it's actually a uh, preparation of the, the area uh, before planting trees in the Northern Negev. Uh, this was uh, filmed um, a bit uh, uh, north of Be'er Sheva. And uh, uh, we actually uh, um, asked the question, is this the solution? Uh, what is the actual problem that, that these uh, afforestation uh, um, works are trying to solve? Uh, this is also from the, the same area, that's the area of Be'er Sheva. Uh, it might be in the springtime a beautiful blooming uh, area, but this is what it becomes after the uh, heavy uh, machinery of Kakal uh, is uh, going over the, the area. Uh, they pile uh, piles of, uh, of earth that uh, supposed to stop the run of water and uh, to uh, pull them. And then they uh, plant the trees uh, but unfortunately, this is not the natural uh, landscape and the ecological uh, uh, nature, nature of this area. Again, this is the uh, north uh, of this area. This is in the Mediterranean part of Israel, the, the uh, northern part uh, near the Carmel. Again, you can see here a beautiful uh, uh, grassland, but this is how planting trees is done in Israel today. You do not see uh, a bunch of uh, uh, school uh, kids uh, with their teacher, with a bucket and, uh, and a small uh, uh, plant, you can ac actually, uh, uh, they, they use the heavy machinery in order to uh, plant the trees. Uh, and this is what it looks like. This is in the Modi'in area. 
uh, again, an area which is uh, an open area, beautiful uh, uh, shrubland, uh, but you can see here uh, piles of, of uh, new, newly planted uh, trees. Again, we have nothing against trees, but it's, it's not supposed to be in the wrong place and it has all kinds of effects and I will present them uh, briefly. So uh, Israel does have natural, uh, um, I wouldn't say forests, but natural uh, uh, woodland uh, dense, uh, it, we called it Choresh or Maki, uh, densely, uh, dense area of, of uh, trees, but the majority of Israel is actually um, um, characterized by ecosystems in which trees are naturally scarce. You can see here the Golan Heights, you can see here uh, the area of uh, the northern uh, Negev. This is in the western Negev. Uh, this is in the area of, uh, of uh, Lachish. Uh, um, and uh, these uh, landscapes actually uh, inhabit uh, all kinds of uh, special uh, biodiversity, special species like this uh, uh, um, long-legged buzzard. You can see here a type of uh, special lizard, uh, special uh, iris, uh, and they are all uh, unique in the fact that they grow in areas in which trees are naturally scarce. Uh, this is not by accident. Uh, the ecosystems are actually uh, derived by the geology and by the uh, um, uh, precipitation. So you can see here, for example, in the Golan Heights that we, has lo we have lots of uh, basalt uh, uh, volcanic uh, uh, terrain, uh, which is naturally uh, characterized in the grasslands. You can see here the uh, Eastern Galil, uh, also an uh, area which is uh, characterized in grasslands. You can see, see here the dunes of uh, the coastal plain and the red line here is the 200 millimeter line in which uh, actually this is the desert uh, edge. Uh, south of this, uh, of this line, it's a more uh, arid area which is naturally uh, very uh, rare in uh, tree cover. So up until today, uh, in the past 100 years, uh, 100,000 hectares of, uh, of land is, have already been af uh, forested and planted in, in trees uh, in Israel. And uh, you, can, you might think that both sides of the pictures are actually green. Uh, so what's the difference? Let's, let's just plant the left-hand side as well. Uh, but actually, uh, it does matter if the area is planted or not planted in semi-arid areas, and I will try and uh, uh, present why. And actually the biggest uh, uh, excuse to try and plant trees uh, in recent years has been uh, climate change. And we all have read probably articles like this article that uh, was talking about a mind-blowing uh, potential to tackle climate change by planting trees globally. And this uh, uh, article in The Guardian is actually based on a very famous article from a year ago that was published in Science, uh, which was called The Global Tree uh, Restoration Pot Potential. And that uh, article, uh, that research article, claimed that this is the ultimate answer to climate change, to just uh, plant lots of trees uh, globally, and then we got the climate change problem solved. Now let's take a deep, uh, deeper dive into this uh, uh, claim that uh, if we plant lots of trees, we can actually save uh, the plant. Uh, this is basically the, the map in which uh, uh, we're supposed to, uh, to uh, plant lots of trees and then uh, uh, tackle climate change. And if we take a deeper dive uh, into Eastern Africa, into Tanzania, uh, some of you have probably heard or seen pictures and maybe even visited a very special place in which I point here, which is called the Serengeti Park. And actually the Serengeti is one of the places that you can see uh, this uh, article in, the, in science has suggested uh, to plant trees. You take the beautiful, unique uh, grasslands of Eastern Africa uh, with the elephant and, and the giraffes and, and the uh, wildebeest and to plant trees over there. And this of course has raised lots of concerns. This is an article in, uh, in another uh, research uh, uh, journal, which uh, said the trouble uh, with trees, afforestation plants in, uh, for Africa was problematic and they have mapped the uh, afforestation pro uh, uh, plants with uh, biodiversity, which is sensitive to planting trees uh, with the native grassland species. And they said that it's going to uh, jeopardize the survival of many iconic uh, um, 
species in Africa. Uh, so they said, let's uh, keep the savannas and the grasslands uh, of, of the Serengeti, the Masai Mara, the Kruger Park, the entire uh, African uh, uh, parks, let's keep it as they are and not try to plant trees over there. You can see here that also in the UK, a similar uh, mapping was done. They took the map of the uh, plan to, uh, for, uh, to plant uh, uh, trees for afforestation in the UK. And they have found that 30 to 50% of this area, uh, 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 30 to 50% of ecologically valuable habitats in the UK are going to be lost if they're going to fulfill uh, the full scale of the uh, forestation plants uh, in the UK. You can see here, uh, according to different habitats, but for example, the, this specific uh, habitat of uh, grassland is going to be uh, lost by 50%. So this is a very uh, problematic outcome. This is a picture from Ethiopia in which uh, this guy is proudly measuring the newly planted tree to uh, send it to the European donors to show them how beautiful the tree that they have paid for is uh, uh, growing in Ethiopia. The problem is that this is a, a tree called Acacia saligna. Uh, it's an Australian uh, tree. It's uh, considered one of the, in, it's in the list of the worst hundreds uh, uh, invasive species uh, globally. It's a very problematic uh, uh, species which causes fires. Uh, it depletes the uh, aquifer from water, uh, a very problematic tree. And we're, we definitely don't want to plant it uh, nowhere outside uh, Australia. But if we now uh, dive into our little uh, holy land, you can see here the same map and let's take, take a look at a few of the, of the sites that were prese uh, uh, presented as the potential uh, places for afforestation. And the first place is the Golan Heights. Again, an iconic grassland, uh, very unique uh, by its uh, 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 landscape, uh, lots of unique species that uh, will uh, actually be only uh, uh, living in this uh, uh, grasslands. And if it's going to be planted with trees, these species are going to be excluded. Uh, another place is the uh, uh, sand dunes of uh, Nitsanim Park. It's a very uh, special uh, sand uh, dune uh, um, nature reserve, which uh, kids really love to come and uh, uh, roller in the, in the sand dunes. Again, not the place that you would uh, think it uh, fits uh, a forestation. And uh, obviously uh, there was lots of uh, uh, debate and lots of uh, um, uh, misagreement with this uh, uh, original uh, science uh, 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 research paper. And uh, you can see here that uh, the edition of science after uh, it was published, there were lots of uh, comment uh, uh, research papers that argued that uh, the original paper was actually uh, wrong and uh, there are lots of problems uh, in, the, in the notion or the concept that if we plant uh, Africa and the Middle East and uh, uh, other uh, places uh, in uh, Europe, uh, we will save the planet. And this is a, a recent article from uh, the New York Times uh, written by a few of the leading scientists uh, in, uh, in uh, forest uh, ecology. And they say, they said planting trees will not save the, the world. And this is uh, true, especially for Israel, but I will present it uh, uh, in a few minutes. So afforestation uh, uh, is not the, the, the answer for climate change in Israel and also in many other parts of the world because a few, uh, uh, a few uh, reasons, and I will present all of them, but briefly, uh, this is the highlights. First of all, it's not practical. There's not enough area in globally and also in Israel to plant so uh, uh, many uh, uh, areas, so many hectares in order to uh, establish uh, uh, the answer for climate change. The second problem is that there's not enough water and nutrients to feed these trees. Trees do not just uh, um, grow you know, out of the air. They need water, they need nutrients and uh, uh, we just don't have uh, these resources naturally in those areas. Uh, there, there is uh, an overestimation uh, by a fivefold of the potential uh, carbon uh, sequestration uh, um, that was uh, analyzed by the, that uh, original uh, article. 
So uh, uh, if even if we plant the entire area and it's going to be uh, filled with forests, uh, it's not going to uh, to capture the amount of carbon that they uh, thought it's going to uh, capture. And uh, uh, strangely enough, uh, planting planting forests in some areas of the world, including the southern part of Israel, is actually uh, warming the climate and not cooling the the climate. And I will uh, explain it in a few minutes. Uh, but also, uh, this uh, this uh, plan is also uh, damaging. It harms biodiversity, and uh, it may be the the worst. Uh, Problem is that uh, there, it creates an illusion of solution that delays the real and painful solutions that basically are let's uh, deal with our economy, fly less, drive less, and, uh, uh, and reduce uh, carbon emissions. So okay. let's get back. That's, that's uh, the warming effect. Our... I just sorry, it was warming exactly the warming effect, not the warming effect. There also might be warming effect in the, those trees, but there's the warming effect was referred to. Yes, it was just a typo. Yes, I, I was uh, mentioning the warming effect, and I'm going yeah. to explain everything in a few minutes. Let's yes, warming be, is with an A. a bit, uh, more... Sorry, warming is with an A. There were people who were asking. OK, sorry. Uh, you can uh, write a D in my uh, English uh, uh, grade. No, but no, no, it's just on. confusing, because trees have worms also. Ah, OK, sorry. OK, okay. so. Um, um, uh, so let's get back to the details. If we take this global massive plan to uh, plant trees in the entire uh, planet uh, and take our uh, estimated uh, potential that uh, uh, those uh, researchers have uh, 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 analyzed for us, they claim that uh, Israel has uh, uh, 120,000 hectares potentially suitable for planting trees. That's a 0.01% uh, of global potential. Try to uh, remember this number. It's not big, but try to remember this number because it's not real. And you probably ask yourself, where in a small country like Israel, there are 120,000 hectares free for afforestation. And I can also uh, already uh, spoil, uh, uh, make, make a small spoiler. There is uh, no such area. And uh, we took the, uh, the, the, the area in which uh, uh, the, the, that uh, global plan uh, designated uh, for Israel for potential uh, uh, planting of forests, and we put it on the map, on the Israeli map. And you can see uh, already that the majority of the area that they have designated for planting forests is actually uh, in the desert. This is the Dead Sea maybe 20, 30 millimeters uh, of, uh, of uh, annual rain, uh, uh, not hardly enough for uh, uh, sustaining a forest. Uh, and so already you can see that it's not practical, but we took and we analyzed it. And we have found that 34% uh, of what they thought can be suitable for planting trees is actually uh, on dry land. Um, 17% 17, 17 is already built urban areas. 16% are agriculture fields, which are supposed to produce food for, for Israel. 8% are already Maquis, which is a, a, a very dense uh, woodland, which is already naturally uh, a tree land over there. 7% are re reserves and natural parks, which are supposed to uh, maintain natural biodiversity. 5% is already a planted forest, so you are left with 11% of what was the potential to plant in Israel, which are supposedly free and uh, willing to be planted, out of which 7% are actually in a dry land between 200 and 300 millimeters of annual rain, which is very marginal for uh, planting a forest, and only 4% of the, uh, the original potential are actually uh, free areas to be planted. Those areas as are the, the grasslands that we are so, so uh, uh, desperately want to uh, maintain for the Israeli biodiversity. But I can just already show you that out of the original potential plan to uh, plant trees in uh, Israel to fight climate change, out of those 120,000 hectares, which are 0. 
0.01% uh, of the global potential, you are actually left with uh, a much smaller number. And this, these areas, this small number, which is not hardly substantial to fight climate change globally, these are the areas that they want to plant trees in. It's the beautiful less plains in the northern Negev. It's the beautiful uh, grasslands of the eastern Galil and the beautiful uh, uh, areas in the, also in the northern Negev, the blooming uh, areas in the northern Negev. So already you can see that this is not going to be a meaningful uh, answer to climate change, but it's going to be probably harmful. The second problem is that we hardly have any uh, enough water and nutrients to feed all those uh, uh, supposed uh, uh, forest in Israel, but it's not only in Israel. You can see here an, a research article from 2013 that already said that there are ecological limits to terrestrial biological carbon dioxide um, removal. And again, I show you the map and you can see that the majority of the uh, areas that they have marked as potential forests in Israel are in the desert. Uh, unfortunately, because of climate change, the arid line, the, the line in which uh, uh, south of it, it's uh, too dry to, uh, to sustain forests, the arid line will move north. So some of the areas which are today supposedly suitable for planting forests is, are not going to be suitable in 10, 20, 30 years, unfortunately. Also, there's going to be a major precipitation uh, decrease uh, uh, projected for the northern part of Israel, the entire areas which are marked in red. So unfortunately, even areas in the northern part of Israel are going to uh, get less and less uh, rain in the future. So how are we going to sustain all those trees which are going to be planted? Uh, already today, we see increased uh, tree mortality in planted forests versus natural ones and we see elevated tree mortality due to drought and wildfires already today. And uh, forest uh, long-term survival was uh, doubted uh, south of Kiryat Gat, which is somewhere in this area. So these entire areas are not uh, suitable for planting a uh, forest, unfortunately, that's the reality. Uh, the maybe uh, optimistic uh, side of the, the picture is that the local uh, ecosystems uh, and uh, plant communities in Israel, the local natural biodiversity is actually uh, resilient and suitable for uh, climate change because uh, the, the uh, Israeli land has suffered many, many uh, periods of, uh, of a dry, uh, a dry climate. And this uh, research article have found that Middle Eastern plant communities actually tolerate nine years of drought uh, and have done it well, unlike uh, planted uh, forests. So the, the good news is that our uh, natural ecosystem, the natural uh, plant species are, um, seems to be more resilient to a uh, dry uh, uh, climate and to climate change. Uh, another point is that uh, tree planting uh, is uh, not done on a, an empty ground. Uh, you can see here a planted forest, and you can see here a non-planted forest, a natural grassland in Israel. And uh, actually, grasslands store quite uh, a lot of carbon, but they do it below ground. Uh, these plants are all, they store carbon during the spring, and then they assimilate this carbon to the roots, and they store it inside uh, the soil. And this is an article from uh, a research uh, article from California that has uh, suggested that grasslands may be more reliable carbon sinks than forests in California. One of the reasons is, of course, because California suffer from lots of uh, wildfires, but the same uh, phenomenon is uh, unfortunately uh, happens in Israel as well. So store carbon beneath uh, the ground is maybe more reliable as a carbon sink than above the ground in a forest. And of course, if you plant in a, a grassland and you uh, tilt uh, uh, and, and you move the soil in order to plant the trees, you of course release carbon in the process. A another problem is that a planted forest is not a natural one. Usually when we uh, imagine a forest, we imagine this picture, this beautiful uh, cloud forest in the uh, Amazonas, but unfortunately most planted uh, uh, forests 
they look like this. Uh, they are uh, uh, quite uh, homogeneous. Uh, they are uh, planted uh, uh, in uh, semi-arid or arid areas, and they do not uh, uh, store the, the same amount of carbon like a natural uh, uh, cloud forest or rainforest. Actually, that was uh, analyzed, and uh, it was found that plantations uh, cannot imitate the productivity in a natural forest, and their, their carbon uh, 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 sequestration rate may be slower by 40-fold than uh, uh, the natural uh, uh, forest. And of course, I uh, also remind that if you plant a forest, you usually plant a forest uh, very densely, and then after a decade or two, you come and you uh, take out some of the trees which have not developed. You, you, uh, done all, you do all kinds of uh, management actions, which in turn also uh, release carbon to the atmosphere. Uh, and I get to the war warming effect. I'm, uh, I apologize for the, for the spelling uh, uh, mistake uh, earlier, but uh, I get to the warming effect uh, uh, of uh, planting a forest. This is uh, the Yatir forest in northern, uh, northern Negev in Israel. And what you can see here is carbon is not the whole story. And you have a very complex uh, process of a, a balance between carbon that is stored in the trees and the way that uh, the trees are affecting the heat flux in the area. Imagine a very uh, warm day in which you uh, uh, walk outside with a black t-shirt and you uh, shortly going to feel very warm. Why? Because the black t-shirt is uh, uh, absorbing the sun uh, uh, rays and it uh, turns them into heat uh, uh, energy. And the exact uh, thing happens if you plant a very dark green uh, patch of forest inside uh, a very uh, light colored uh, area, which is desert. And you can see here that uh, uh, this is the, the uh, reflection of, uh, of a sun and radiation from the, uh, um, from the soil, from the terrain uh, back to the atmosphere. You can see that uh, the light colored uh, natural desert uh, reflects the majority of the uh, energy as sun rays back to the atmosphere. It doesn't hit the atmosphere, but uh, the majority of the of the sun rays in the dark patch of the forest are actually transformed into a heat and it actually produces a warming effect. Uh, and it was actually uh, analyzed, uh, calculated for the Atir forest and it was found that it takes uh, at least 80 years from the minute uh, they have planted the, the forest until the warming effect is balancing uh, with the carbon uh, uh, effect and it starts to have some kind of a cooling effect over the, the atmosphere. So uh, I don't think that we have today the time to wait 80 years until some kind uh, of forest in Israel is going to uh, have the, the cooling effect that uh, we want. And we don't have that much time. We are in a, an emergency in terms of climate change. And uh, uh, almost last but not least is the problem with uh, the uh, delusion of, of, a, of a solution. Policymakers uh, try to avoid politically costly measures. This, uh, what you see here is the demonstration after President Macron in France have tried to uh, put a tax on the, on the fuel in order to, to uh, um, in, to put incentives for the public to, uh, to uh, uh, reduce uh, carbon emissions. And of course, people have uh, went to the streets and said, no, no, we don't want to pay more uh, about fuel. And then you come to the same policy uh, makers and you say, look, you don't have to, put, to, to make any major politically costly uh, measure. You can just plant trees. Everybody loves trees. But then you have a delusion of a solution. It's not going to solve climate change. The window for real change in terms of policy is closing fast. And we do not tackle the major uh, uh, reasons why climate change happens, which are emissions and the, the need to reduce emissions to move to renewable energies, etc. So this is a very uh, uh, drastic problem with uh, the delusion of uh, uh, forests as the ultimate uh, solution for climate change. 
And the reason why I'm in this, uh, uh, making this whole talk is because of the uh, damage to biodiversity. I'll try to be brief because I see that I have already uh, uh, talked too much. Uh, Israel is not a big country. It's not a, a major uh, carbon uh, uh, producer in terms of climate change, but it is in a very, very special place and unique place in terms of biodiversity. This is the biodiversity global hotspot map, which have uh, designated less than 2% of terrestrial global area as the most important places for biodiversity conservation. You can see here uh, Amazonas, uh, you can see here Central America, California, New Zealand, um, the Kavkaz, Madagascar, uh, uh, and Eastern Africa, and you can also see uh, the uh, Mediterranean uh, area, including Israel. So we are a very special place in terms of biodiversity, and we have to keep it that way. So I've already shown you this picture. Uh, many uh, ecosystems in Israel are naturally not planted with trees, and because of that, there are lots of uh, 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 unique species over there. Now, one might say, okay, if we plant trees, we don't have, uh, let's say a few species, we'll have other species, what does it matter? So uh, in this uh, research, uh, they have uh, measured the effect on the number of, uh, of uh, species after they have planted forests. And you can see that uh, while turning shrublands or grassland into planted forests, there is actually a decrease in the number of species, but this is not actually the, the right question. The right question is which species were excluded and which species have benefited. And uh, what we have found after compiling lots of uh, research uh, uh, articles that were done in Israel and in other uh, similar places is that afforestation in sensitive natural areas replaces the natural animal and plant community and excludes native and especially species uh, like those animals that you see here, uh, like this beautiful, those beautiful birds that uh, are all from Israel. Uh, and I will just briefly uh, uh, show you a few slides just to show you that I'm not making this up. You can see uh, the reference for the right uh, uh, scientific source in each of the, in each of the um, um, different uh, ecosystems and different taxonomic uh, Group. So for birds, you, you, this was found, what I've just showed you, was found to be true in the less plains in Israel, in the northern Negev, in the semi-steppe uh, uh, shrublands uh, in Israel, uh, and in Mediterranean shrubland. Uh, briefly, uh, the reason is that because once you plant trees, you uh, enable uh, predators like uh, ravens and like... Uh, 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 um, like uh, uh, small uh, uh, raptors to stand on these trees. And if uh, uh, a songbird is trying to nest in a small shrub beneath this tree, it's going to be spotted by uh, this uh, predator that sits on the tree and it's going to be eaten. Uh, and again, uh, predators like this beautiful uh, long-legged buzzard, uh, some of you might see that there is a lizard in his uh, claws uh, these uh, raptors are not, uh, not uh, adapted for uh, uh, hunting in forests. They, adapted, they are adapted to hunt in an open area. And not only that they need uh, this, uh, this, this, those open areas in order to hunt for their food, they need it in order to hunt and feed their uh, chicks. And uh, this uh, long-legged uh, buzzard uh, was found to uh, uh, bring uh, 260 prey individuals from those open, unforested areas into the uh, for uh, into the nest in each uh, season, in each uh, nesting season. So those uh, top predators they actually need large uh, areas, vast areas which are not planted uh, with trees in order to uh, to hunt the the, pre the prey to to feed the chicks. It was also found for uh, this beautiful. Uh, short-toed uh, eagle, which mainly feeds on, on snakes. Snakes uh, need, in Israel, they, the majority of the snakes need the open patches, which is not forested in order to uh, uh, get uh, the sun radiation to hit uh, their bodies. 
This way it was also found for reptiles in the left plains. You can see here the diversity of uh, reptiles in a natural area. And you can see here how the diversity shrinks in a planted uh, uh, forest. And you can also see that these species, the Beersheva fringe fingered lizard, an endemic, endemic uh, critically endangered species of a lizard in Israel is totally absent from the forested area and it is present in the natural area. So this species is actually uh, on the verge of extinction uh, among other uh, things because of afforestation in Israel. It's endemic and critically endangered. This was also found for uh, other uh, types of ecosystems for reptiles in the semi-steppal uh, shrublands, in the Mediterranean shrubland, uh, etc. And it was also found for butterflies uh, in the uh, prairies in, of Israel, in the Mediterranean shrublands. Uh, these three beautiful species of butterflies are actually excluded, totally excluded from the area after uh, the planting of uh, trees. Uh, again, it was found for uh, uh, spiders in the Les Plains, uh, for uh, scorpions in the desert. It was found for wild bees in the Mediterranean shrublands. So you get the picture. Uh, and all the details are in the report that, uh, that uh, we have compiled. Uh, why does it happen? It happens because uh, a few uh, ecological processes. The first is because of what I told you, um, the, uh, uh, the decrease in, in shrubland foraging areas for uh, big raptors. It happens also because of uh, shading or leaf litter or loss of heterogeneity uh, in the habitat because of fragmentation and direct damage to the soil, like I told you, um, by the heavy machinery and direct impact on natural uh, resources. But uh, it gets even more complicated because planted forests are uh, usually, they have an edge effect on the adjacent natural areas uh, because of fragmentation or even because of the pines that uh, migrate uh, slowly into the, uh, natural area. And this uh, uh, research have shown that from this forested pine uh, 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 area, the pines are slowly migrating into the shrubland. And after uh, they, they spread, uh, forest uh, species like the jay actually uh, migrate uh, and use the, the pines in order to, uh, uh, to uh, widening their, their uh, area of uh, foraging and they have found to damage and to uh, hunt uh, small chicks of, uh, of songbirds which, was, uh, which were uh, nesting in small shrubs. So dozens of thousands of hectares in Israel of natural areas can actually be saved. They do not have to uh, look like this uh, homogeneous planted forest in the northern Negev. They can look like these areas or these areas, uh, or these areas which are beautiful, which are unique, which store carbon, which are great for recreation and which hold unique biodiversity. And basically what we say is keep and maintain the existing forests in Israel. Do not touch them, use them for recreation, but also do not harm and do not uh, disrupt the natural uh, areas, keep them for recreation and biodiversity, but as they are, do not uh, plan them because it doesn't help climate and it damages their biodiversity. And we think that uh, there's a time for a change in the narrative that we have to plant trees everywhere that, uh, everywhere that uh, we can. Uh, and basically what we say globally is first protect existing forests everywhere. If it exists, protect it, do not touch it. Second, and this is not our call, this is something that uh, the leading scientists for uh, forest ecology globally has said, we store natural forests in the tropics and subtropics because on those areas, the forests do not have the, for the, the warming effect, they have the cooling effect for capturing carbon, but do it naturally, help the natural forest to uh, rehabilitate, do not just plant artificial man-made uh, plantations prevent wildfires, reduce emissions, fly less, dry less, drive less, uh, buy less, and of course, manage the entire uh, 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 energy sector accordingly. 
for Israel, the same uh, recommendation, and of course, protect the natural ecosystems, the grasslands, and uh, the natural drylands uh, uh, in Israel. Do not uh, plant trees because it just doesn't help. And I will just end by showing you that there's lots to be done uh, in managing the natural areas. There are lots of projects, beautiful projects that we do in order to preserve the natural uh, uh, open areas which are not forested, which are actually natural ecosystems in Israel. And I will just show you one example. Uh, and the example is of this beautiful bird. It's the Hubara bustard, very uh, unique, very weird uh, uh, bird that uh, lives in Israel. We have something like uh, 300 pairs in uh, Israel. And this interesting bird is uh, nesting in the Nitzana air. It's right in the, in the edge, in the border with Egypt. But every summer it walks. Uh, it, it can fly, but it prefers to walk. So it walks something like 60 kilometers to one place called Chatserim in the summertime. And I guess you imagine that this is a nature reserve, but uh, unfortunately it's not, like, although it looks like a nature, nature reserve, it is actually the biggest uh, Air Force base in Israel called the Chatserim uh, uh, Air Force Base. And this is an area, it's actually fenced because of the security issues, but because it is fenced, uh, it holds, it doesn't have uh, um, um, uh, herds of uh, sheep that eat uh, the grassland and it has lots of food for the birds. And what we have done for the past few years is actually a work with the uh, army base, with the uh, pilot uh, uh, course cadets, and we have shown them uh, the, the birds, the Hubara bastards, and we have uh, persuaded them not to uh, uh, plant forests inside the, the base, but actually to uh, keep the natural grassland and to uh, clean all the uh, garbage that the, the base has uh, uh, put there uh, in 50 years. You can see here uh, the cadets after one of the activities uh, with all the garbage that they have uh, collected and was actually afterwards uh, uh, transferred to, a, to a, a garbage site. Uh, so to conclude, uh, we need to stop uh, afforestation in sensitive natural ecosystem in Israel. We can and we should plant trees within cities, within uh, settlements, but not in the natural uh, areas. It is just uh, not helping climate change and it is harmful. And there's lots to be done in order to preserve the natural areas. It helps the climate change uh, fight and it, it helps uh, biodiversity. And of course, it maintains the uh, landscape of uh, our uh, country and the, the, the same landscape that uh, our ancestors have actually uh, witnessed uh, uh, in ge generations uh, before us. Uh, wow. And that's it. Wow, alone. Thank you so much. This has been incredibly informative and uh, interesting and for many, many people surprising. You haven't seen the chats uh, and you won't have time now because we have more questions than I think we've ever had for uh, any of uh, the 30 something webinars we've done since, since COVID hit. Uh, I'll get right into it. There's a million questions. I'm gonna, one of the big groups of questions has to do not surprisingly with the Karen Kamel Israel or as they're translated in English, the Jewish National Fund. I'll just say before everybody tells me that the JNF USA and JNF Canada have split legally from uh, Jewish National Fund Kakal, but Kakal can't call itself just JNF. It has to say Kakal JNF because of all these legal battles. Um, and, and before I ask, begin to ask the questions, I'll just say my own, I'm coming to this. It's what I told you it's one of my favorite topics because I, I learned this from you. I learned it before this report came out. I put the link in the, in the, uh, in the uh, chat and everybody should know the webinar is recorded so you can see this and you refer to alone statistics on this recorded webinar it will be on our site uh, with all of the recorded webinars. Um, it, it drives me nuts for two reasons. One is a fundraiser. So many people give money to Kakao to plant these forests. And, and not only are the forests not needed, the money is not needed. Kakao in Israel is a, owns 13% of the land of Israel. It develops that real estate as it sees fit. It also manages the forests of Israel, including the parts that are not on its land, uh, outsourced by the government of Israel. Uh, it does this in all kinds of terrible ways. You, you mentioned many of them. I have 
more criticism of cacao. Uh, and it also bugs me as a, when I was a father of young kids and we used to go out to the Ben Shemin forest with our kids, I would say to myself, why do they call this a forest? There's no undergrowth. It is, as you called it, a plantation. The JNF plants plantations, not forests mostly, but a lot of questions about it. People are asking, oh, why don't we just consult with JNF and tell them where they should plant if they're planting in the wrong places? And people wonder, uh, Alon Tal wrote about how JNF used to plant badly, but now it's planting better. Uh, has, there been, has there been progress? And uh, they also wanna know, well, don't we get funding from cacao? Uh, I don't think we do actually directly, but we do fight battles sometimes on the side of cacao. So how does that work, that whole, uh, the whole relationship with cacao and therefore a forestation policy? Okay, that's uh, lots of issues. Uh, there are lots um, of questions I just well, summed up. Okay, it's a very complicated issue. I, I just say a few things and I'm probably going to, you have to remind me some, some of the questions. Uh, first of all, I have to say, uh, Cacao is not all bad, not all forests are wrong. Uh, there are forests, planted forests in Israel, which have developed an undergrowth and there are lots of uh, species in there and lots of biodiversity. What we say is that today, 2021, there's not room for new uh, uh, afforestation actions in natural areas in Israel. It doesn't mean that the, ex the existing forests are uh, useless or meaningless. We have to, of course, keep them and maintain them, and they, they do hold lots of benefits for recreation and other uh, benefits. That, so, so I have to, to say that, you know, it's not like all bad, all wrong. It's not black and white, but in terms of making afforestation plans in natural areas in Israel, that's wrong. Uh, in terms of uh, cacal, Kakal is, um, is managing uh, something like 10%, uh, a bit more of the Israeli uh, areas. It's very complex legally because they actually are a private company. Uh, it's the only country that we know of globally in which the Forest Service is not a government agency. It's actually a private company. And that's a very major problem because uh, if, of course, uh, you want to maybe ask them why they do something or you want to influence what they do, or you maybe want to appeal and, uh, and uh, go to the Supreme Court, uh, uh, you, you are actually not, um, you're not able to uh, appeal because uh, if it's a government agency, it's regulated and they're not regulated. So it's a very a strange uh, anomaly in which uh, the Forest Service is actually not a government agency. And this is something that uh, strategically we are trying to change. We are actually, uh, we have uh, appealed to the uh, Justice, Justice Department, uh, uh, the Ministry of Justice, and we have uh, pointed out that uh, the Israeli government uh, needs to uh, have its own Forest Service government agency. Uh, which is going to have a policy and, uh, you know, a board, a public board, everything. And uh, it's going, of course, to be written in, in to, to be uh, acting by law. So this is not what happens in Israel. Uh, in Israel, it's much more complicated. I won't get into all the details. It's in the report. Um, okay. Is cacao is cacao improving alone? Have they learned at all? Are their forestry policies better than they used to be? Well, uh, that depends. Basically, um, you can say that there is uh, an improvement in the way that the plant trees in the Mediterranean area, which means in the northern part of Israel, because over there, they're not planting uh, only pines like they used to be. They plant more uh, broad leaves like uh, pistachia and uh, oak and uh, uh, trees like that. They do it a bit more uh, sensitively, uh, less uh, herbicide, stuff like that. So basically you can say that they are improving, but again, for us, if it's a natural grassland in the north of Israel in the Golan Heights, it doesn't matter if it's a broadleaf or a pine tree, it, it just needs to, to stay uh, uh, natural. But in that sense, you can say that they have improved. They do manage their forests much better in terms of biodiversity. They, they, are, they do all kinds of, uh, um, um, uh, 
uh, red list uh, endangered species uh, surveys and they try to monitor, they try to uh, not uh, spray the herbicides in the place where, uh, for example, irises are uh, growing. So you can say that they are improving in the northern part of Israel. But in the northern Negev, uh, what is happening is even worse. Uh, I, the, the, the video that I've showed you with the bulldozers, uh, that's what happens, okay? Uh, of course, it's a very, very, very political uh, issue. I won't get into all the details, but you understand that uh, it's not only planting trees for climate change. Maybe that's what they say, but uh, the, the real reason is that uh, the Israeli uh, government is trying to uh, exclude the, the Bedouins from there. Uh, and they use they use cacal and their forests as a, as a mean. Now, uh, we are a conservation uh, organization. I won't get into that, my uh, personal uh, 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 opinions about the, the whole political issue of the Bedouins, but clearly uh, you cannot claim that you plant forests in the Northern Negev because of climate change or because of your improved biodiversity. Of course, it damages climate change because of course, it damages biodiversity and it's a political issue. And what they are, are doing uh, there is that they are um, using a legal loophole and they do not, uh, they do not uh, pass through the, um, the main road of planning authorities in Israel. Uh, we have went to the high court uh, with this issue five years ago. It has it proved a bit because the government have put kind of a committee to a bit regulate it, but uh, probably we're going to appeal again uh, very soon because it hasn't improved uh, enough. But what, what I do have to say is that we're running out of time because they have already planted thousands and thousands of hectares and the natural areas are just, you know, it's the the in Hebrew, uh, we call it kifsat arash. It's, it's the, the remains and the remains of natural areas that we have to protect. And they are using uh, terrible methods in order to plant in the Northern Negev. So in that sense, it has improved, it has got, went worse. So would you say, there was a follow-up question to all this JNF questions. What would you say to the question, do the JNF scientists not know what you know? Um, Well, first of all, maybe you should ask them what they say, but I, I have to say that uh, the answer to my uh, view is not what do the cacal scientists say or not say. This is a public issue. This is a public resource. That's land, that's landscapes, that, that, that's biodiversity. The ones that should manage uh, uh, biodiversity uh, forest policy in Israel is the government through an agency, government agency, and this is the platform to hold the entire discussion. So uh, today, of course, there is an ongoing debate. Uh, on one side, there are lots, there is lots of scientists and us and the Nature and Parks Authority. On the other side, there is Kakal. Of course, when you have lots of money you can uh, sponsor lots of uh, research and then miraculously you have lots of uh, support in the academia. Uh, but again, it's not, I have to also to say, it's not all black and white, but we try to look at that, to, to make a zoom out and look at the big picture. The big picture says uh, uh, it's uh, not helpful to plant no, new forests in Israel. The challenge of managing the existing forests in Israel is big enough. We say to Kakal, focus on the existing forest. You have lots of work over there. No, and good luck with that, that's fine. But keep the natural areas as they are. Uh, I, I can tell you that uh, to every issue, you will, you will be able to bring a few scientific uh, opinions, but I think that I can safely say that uh, on the broad scale, uh, the majority of the ecologists in Israel do not think that the afforestation actions in natural areas should take place uh, today. Great, thank you. Um, I'll just want to say, I, I want to just emphasize that and, and, and say, um, in case people don't are not aware of the fact, you, you know, we are talking about an ethical public discourse about a 
about a natural national resource of the country. As you said, no other country that we know of has outsourced its afforestation to a private organization. But the crazy thing, the absurd thing, the, 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 the injustice of it, the further injustice of it is that the Kakal JNF was founded pre-state for the Jews by the Jews uh, and it uh, by its own charter uh, is, is not a really an organization that encompasses the needs at all of the non-Jewish population of this country, uh, which is why it used its forest cessation policy in the Negev to displace Bedouins or to hand them in, and the same thing in the Galilee in the north. And uh, we in SPNI are working on a, uh, a sustainable planning forum of Jews and Arabs in the Galilee, uh, exactly to uh, look at uh, how we uh, legitimate uh, development needs can be uh, squared with uh, this uh, forestation policy, which is not even run by the government of Israel. Uh, so yeah, that is a further question. Here, alone, a lot of questions about the difference between afforestation and reforestation. Uh, when, and we, we talk about restoring Israel. W what, were there forests, were some of these lands forested in the past? And when we say the past, what do we mean by the past? W what should we be looking at as to what the lands were in their natural state? Well, that, that's a great question. Uh, I'll try to briefly uh, suggest an answer. First of all, um, there are many views about how uh, Israeli land was, uh, was seen in, uh, in the past. And like you said, what's the past? Uh, we, know, we do know for certain that uh, uh, 1,500 years ago, during the Byzantius uh, uh, era, uh, the climate was much... Uh, uh, um, uh, wetter. Uh, we had lot, uh, much, uh, much uh, more rain, especially in the uh, southern part of Israel, and that's why you can actually find uh, antique uh, vineyards in the desert uh, and uh, uh, stuff like that. Uh, um, and we do know that, uh, but, but we do know from, from uh, uh, maps from, uh, let's say, uh, 150 years ago, and even 100 years ago, we do know that uh, vast areas were not forested uh, and were a uh, grassland. Uh, so we can develop this uh, very interesting uh, question about where exactly were forests in Israel in the past and when, uh, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, 2000 years ago, 200 years ago. Uh, uh, to my uh, opinion, it doesn't matter. What matters is uh, maybe if you remember from the beginning of the presentation, the maps that I've shown you is what is the future holds for us. The future, unfortunately, holds for Israel uh, an era of climate change, of the migration of the arid line to the north, of a depletion of precipitation amounts in the uh, uh, northern half of uh, Israel. And that is why it's useless to discuss what was in the past in the future, in the near future, unfortunately. What we are facing is a, a period in which we're going to have more droughts. Trees are going to find it very hard to, to, uh, to uh, uh, be established. And on the other uh, hand, what I've shown you is that the natural uh, vegetation in Israel is actually uh, more resilient to, uh, to droughts and to, uh, uh, to climate change. So the question is, what do we want to see? Because for example, 2000 years ago, maybe you had a patch of forest somewhere, but you did not have uh, army bases, agriculture, cities uh, and infrastructures. So what we ask today is how do we want to see Israel? Do we want to see Israel as a natural, beautiful area in which we have species, uh, unique species, and of course, uh, a neutral, natural landscape? or do we want to try and impose uh, artificially something which is not relevant today and is going to be less relevant in the near future because of the restraints that climate change uh, holds for us. Uh, and I think this is, uh, this is what I'm trying to say that uh, we need to uh, frame our vision differently. When uh, Kakal, uh, 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 person uh, Josef Witz came here uh, many decades ago from po Poland and his vision of a beautiful area was what he saw in Poland, which was natural pine trees. That maybe was relevant for the establishment of the country. 
we are 70 years old today. We can reframe our vision of how our country should look like and adjust it according to the natural restraints that we have in a semi-arid area, which is going to be, unfortunately, drier and drier. So let's uh, uh, hug and, uh, and uh, uh, keep our natural ecosystems. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I want to respect people's times. We're already over our time limit. There are still lots of questions about individual things. Trees do uh, generate oxygen. People want to know that. People want to know why Israel should try to contribute to the climate. And Israel is such a small part of the whole climate change problem. What can we do to contribute to, to solving it? How about, how about that one alone? There's lots of questions, but that one's interesting. Okay, first of all, I have an interesting tip for you. Grass just, also just, uh, creates oxygen. And just quickly, we'll get uh, a couple minutes and then I'll sum up and we'll get going. We're also losing people and I want to be respectful. So let's talk about the, uh, Israel's role in the climate change issue. Okay, so, so first, of all, first of all, grassland also uh, creates oxygen and captures carbon like I showed you. So, of course, I love trees, but you know, natural ecosystems do, do the work according to their uh, restraints. Um, well, uh, like I told you, uh, the way I see it, uh, Israel uh, is uh, uh, a very small player in terms of a global climate change fight but it's a very major player in terms of biodiversity conservation. That's the biodiversity hotspots map that I've showed you. So, uh, and, and it's, it's all linked, okay? Because uh, they're all, uh, everybody talks about the fact that uh, natural ecosystems are the answer for climate change. So, so to protect our natural ecosystems is the right thing for that biodiversity. And that has a global significance because we are a biodiversity hotspot. And it's also good for climate change mitigation. If you really want to be supportive in uh, uh, carbon uh, uh, sequestration and, uh, and natural solutions, and you want to do it on the right place, Jay, you, you might don't want to hear that, but I have, do have to say it, you should go to the big carbon stores in the planet. That's the coral reefs. That's the uh, Amazons and the cloud forests, that's the mangrove, mangrove forests uh, in Southeastern Asia and in uh, Southern and Central America. These are the big, uh, uh, the wetlands, okay? Natural wetlands, these are the big uh, carbon natural sinks that can actually absorb carbon from the atmosphere. So maybe you, you put some money in Israel for ecosystem uh, uh, conservation, but you can also put some money in restoring and preserving those natural uh, carbon and uh, sinks globally. Also, I guess it's not something that uh, we do, but I guess Israel as a startup nation has lots of innovation uh, about uh, trying to solve, uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, reducing emissions. Uh, we have a nice project in Tevabiz about uh, um, uh, adjusting the uh, lights of all kinds of organization to something which is less uh, polluting and less uh, carbon, uh, uh, less uh, emitting less carbon. Uh, you can do all kinds of stuff, but the, the, main, the main thing is do the right solution uh, to the right problem and not try to impose an artificial solution in the wrong place, the wrong time. There's lots to be done in Israel and globally but we just have to do it uh, on, on a very sensitive and, and, and on the professional uh, way. Brilliant, brilliant. Alone, thank you so much. The best webinar yet, in my humble opinion. Uh, and by the way, your English is A level, not, not D level, don't worry, A plus maybe. It's, it's really excellent. Uh, thank you very much. Every, the, the comments have been overwhelming. I don't know if you have a chance to, to glance through them now, um, but I will have to wrap up now uh we'd like to have you on again a lot of people want to know how we can publicize this more i published an article last to Bishvat. it was published in 14 different jewish newspapers across the country uh but other than a personal uh scolding from russell robinson i didn't get much feedback on that uh we will be um this to Bishvat, i'll mention so this to Bishvat is thursday a traditional time to plant the tree uh but we are um we are, our afforestation policy will not let us plant trees that way. 
what we are doing, uh, I will say, uh, is because we do love trees and trees do have purposes in the right place in the right habitat. In all of SPNI and all of the next year, we're gonna plant just a few hundred trees in our urban nature spots for recreation, for shade, not a forestation. That's the difference between tree planting and a forestation. We're just gonna plant a few trees in some wetland habitats, uh, some fruit trees, some, uh, some places that we're restoring nature to, uh, that were former fish ponds, uh, turning agricultural land into wetland nature reserves. We're gonna be doing a small campaign this coming Tubishvat you'll see later in the week if you do wanna plant a tree, but everybody's right. We, this Tubishvat, we shouldn't be planting trees. We should be saving species. Uh, we should be conserving our natural grasslands, shrublands, and not turning them into planted forests. Uh, the JNF of all organizations should know that. Uh, SBNI is trying to get that word out. Uh, I wanna thank Alone very, very much for this presentation. Thank our uh, supporters uh, from around the globe. I think all the continents are, uh, are uh, um, represented here on this call today, uh, this Zoom. Appreciate it. Thank you very much to our boards and our staff. Uh, in the States and in Canada, in France and in the UK. Uh, appreciate it very much. If you have uh, further questions, you can uh, contact uh, Lawrence or I through, uh, through the usual channels, our emails. I hope to see you this Thursday, early in the morning in the States so we can catch the daylight in Israel. Uh, lots of questions about cacao. Please speak truth to power. Those of you who might be in interested in, uh, involved in JNF in the States or in Canada or around the world, tell them what you learned. Send them a copy of this webinar. Uh, uh, put them in touch with us and uh, we'll be happy to share our information. But as Alone says, it's not really about cacao. This discourse should be about how the state of Israel, the government of Israel manages its forest policy. And that is the uh, that is our message for Tu B'Shvat this year. Uh, don't plant a tree in Israel unless you're gonna plant one with us uh, and we're gonna plant it in the right place at, in the right habitat for the right reason. So, uh, and, not, and not on any massive scale whatsoever. We're gonna keep our shrublands and our grasslands um, <clears throat> free of planted forests and uh, full of the incredible biodiversity that Alone uh, mentioned and showed us so beautifully. So thank you everybody. Thank you Alone. Uh, if you have a final word Alone, happy to uh, entertain that or uh, no, okay. So goodbye from, uh, from Israel, uh, from Houston where I am temporarily. See you next time from Tel Aviv if they let me back in. And uh, thanks everybody. Thanks Avi uh, in Canada in the back office and everybody who's been commenting. I can't even keep up with the hundreds of comments and questions that have been coming in uh, since you stopped speaking alone. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. Goodbye. Chag Sameach.